when it first became apparent that China was ramping up its engagement in Africa, people were very kind of wary about what this might mean and was it exploitative and people used the word imperialism. And I don't think we should shy away from some of those debates. But actually, as we get more and more data, I think we see that the impacts are far more fine grained than that. In some cases, it's quite good. In some cases, it's not so good. And I think it's trying to assess that balance sheet of, of, of what that means for Africa. One of the things that strikes me as being important that China did under the communist period was invested a lot into education. So that when they transitioned into a kind of more market economy, you had very well trained, uh, you know, workers. And so they were able to slot into these kind of quite complex technical roles within the within the the factories that were set up. So, you know, what Africa clearly needs is much more investment in education so that, you know, when the time comes that there is, there are those job opportunities, there is a well-trained workforce who can slot into them. And that's, for me, would be one of the key, the key lessons. Africa has been a test ground for how China engages with the rest of the world. So it's been very important for, for understanding bilateral relations, how you do aid, uh, how you negotiate with in multilateral fora. And I think we're going to see over the next 20 years a much greater role that China plays in some of those big fora. But also they're setting up their own kind of development organisations. So there's, there's a big BRICS bank that's being talked about. There is a big Asia infrastructure bank. And this is partly in response to, you know, the, the lack of change on the IMF side, you know, the, the Chinese would like to have more say in that. They were promised more say in these big existing multilateral agencies. But because that's not been as forthcoming as some would like, they've actually said, well, we're going to set up our own and we can do this on our own. And it's leading much more to what people are talking about, South-South cooperation. Africa is the last kind of resource frontier for oil. Now, despite the, the drop off in, in oil prices, there's still been quite a lot of investment in some key African countries. So what we want to do is look at, well, why are the Chinese investing in those countries? So how does that feed into their own domestic and political agendas? But then to work on the African side to say, well, what impact is this having on the development of, of African economies and societies. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about China stitching up kind of resources in Africa and actually there's lots more opportunities for um, what are called the international oil companies or the IOC, so Shell, Total, BP. They, they have to partner with the Chinese very often. So there's, there, there are opportunities for, for collaboration. So to try and improve the, the understanding between those actors would be key. But then the kind of missing bit in the middle is also to look at, well, how do African governments broker that relationship? It's not just that Chinese companies come in and kind of exploit all Africa's resources. There is a, you know, an engagement with those governments. And it's, I think it's key to understand that political process as well. So there's this kind of three tiers of what we're trying to do. The, the drivers, the political engagement and the local impacts. There's lots that can be gained from the Chinese investment. One thing they do is they bundle their oil investment with infrastructure loans and Africa desperately needs infrastructure. So people have seen them quite negatively, but actually for Africans who need roads and IT and, and, and energy supplies, these are vital. So I think we want to also talk to African governments about how they can leverage much more benefits from this Chinese engagement.